to, uh, to introduce this seminar, Dr. Cristina. Uh, Dr. Cristina received a PhD by, in bioengineering and neuroscience from the Syracuse University College of Engineering. She pursued postdoctoral research at, as an NIH fellow in sensory physiology and biophysics at the University of Rochester Medical School. Is current professor and chair of B and BME director in the medical engineering department at the University of South Florida. Previously, he was professor also in otolaryngology, neurobiology, anatomy, and biomedical engineering, and associate chair of otolaryngology at the University of Rochester Medical School for two decades. Dr. Christina, main research currently the center of the etiologies and fossil treatment are acquired here in GLOSS, as well as other uh, areas related to drug delivery, biomedical engineering, and neurostimulation systems. So he's the, the, as I mentioned, the chair of the, of one of the uh, three most, um, you know, uh, uh, strong program of biomedical engineering in the, in the uh, Florida University system, together with UF, and uh, our program, uh, which is the, the program at the University of South Florida. And it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to have him with us today here. And I, I invite you to join me in welcome. Thank you for the nice introduction. It's always great to visit Miami. And I actually visited FIU about eight years ago. So we had the newest biomedical engineering major. We had grad programs, but we came here because we felt FIU was one of the strongest programs around, and we we actually learned a lot about how to set up our student labs and things like that. So thanks for inviting me back. So today I'm going to give you a quick summary of three projects we do in my neuroengineering BME lab. So I'll give you some of the highlights of three different areas. So in terms of what we're going to talk about today, I'll give you these three projects that we had had or have NIH grants on. And two of the three have patents as well. So hot off the presses. And one of them has to do with, uh, or two of them really, drug compound development or things that might help prevent or treat hearing loss. So for many years we said there are no FDA drugs that are approved for treating or preventing hearing loss. There is actually one drug now. So I'm gonna look at uh, things related to age-related hearing loss. But there is one drug now that's really new, newly FDA approved and it's for children who are getting chemotherapy. So when you get chemotherapy, hopefully you, your life is saved. And for many cancers, it's very effective now. However, cisplatin and other platins like carboplatin, they can give you hearing loss or balance problems or tinnitus. So this new drug is sodium thiosulfate. You give it to children after they get chemotherapy. I think it's six hours later and it cuts down a lot on the, the hearing loss. And of course, in a child, that can be really important because they're gonna live a long life. You don't want them to go deaf as they age. So project number one, I'm gonna talk about this new hot compound in neuroscience called ergothionine. And then after that, I'll tell you about some micro pump development that we did we work on hearing loss deafness, so we develop micro pumps for inner ear drug delivery, but you can use them anywhere in the body. And lastly, I'll talk about a um, hormone called aldosterone, which we've shown can slow down age-related hearing loss, and then we have a new twist to that that's coming out this month. Okay. So ergothionine, it's an amino acid and it's a potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. So some of the mechanisms for hearing loss, including age-related hearing loss, 
are elevated inflammation levels in the ear and also development of reactive oxygen species, ROS, oxidative stress. So these are mechanisms that occur in different types of hearing loss, including age-related hearing loss. So ergothionine is interesting, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide, because it has both of these capabilities in one simple compound. So a couple of people I work with, Jill Walton and my wife Susan, who worked with us for many years, who's a research nurse, came up with this idea of administering ergothionine to slow down age-related hearing loss. So we'll take a look at that. And one reason we chose it is there's a lot of evidence coming out now that if you give this to um, aging people, you can decrease some neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, dementia, things like that. Um, it's even approved for pregnant women. That's how safe it is in children. And it's been shown, for example, in pregnancies to cut down on um, pulmonary embolisms that can occur during pregnancy. So it's also very safe, which is a good thing in the drug world because most drugs that are efficacious, meaning that they do something good, they never get to the market because they have side effects that are worse than the good effects. This ergothionine is also very interesting because it's used by the body, but your body can't make it. So you have to eat it. And it turns out that mushrooms have about 600 times the concentration of ergothionine than other vegetables, which have some. So now I'm eating a lot of mushrooms. Okay. So you don't have to memorize this, but the point is, is that from other studies that have come out recently, ergothionine has multiple beneficial properties to the body, which is interesting because your body can't make it. So for today, um, does that show up? No, it doesn't show up. So for today, we're interested in neuroprotection. Cisplatin is the compound in chemotherapeutic agents. So there's some evidence that EGT can be neuroprotective. And then it's a potent antioxidant. So it's removing reactive oxygen species that are occurring during aging, noise-induced hearing loss, chemotherapeutic-induced hearing loss. And it's also anti-inflammatory. So it can decrease inflammatory pathway biomarkers in cells like IL-6, TNF-alpha, things like that. So it has a lot of desirable properties in one simple compound. It's just an amino acid, naturally occurring amino acid. So we thought, if it has all these neuroprotective effects, let's try it on age-related hearing loss. So we did a study with pretty old CBA mice so there are millions of thousands of strains of mice. This one has slow age-related hearing loss like most humans, but it only lives two and a half years, so you can do a whole lifetime study in one grant. So what we did is we got EGT, ergothionine, we um, put it into solution, and we injected it IP. So this is the start of the study. And then almost immediately, we started giving them intraperitoneal injections of ergothionine. And we gave one each day for seven days, and then we gave um, maintenance doses every week for a six month study. And then we would measure, we're interested in age related hearing loss, so we would measure the um, hearing using two measures, which I'll explain to you. But these are the same measures that are used in humans, so you can use them on any mammals. One is called ABR, one is called autoacoustic emission. So it's basically like an audiogram. You go in, you put the headphones on, you press the button when you can hear 
Well, these are physiological responses. So we don't have to get the mice to press a button. And we did those at two months, you know, the beginning, one month, two months, four months, six months. And then at the end, we sacrificed the mice and we took their blood and we took their cochlea, their inner ear, and their brain and other good parts. And we analyzed them. So I'm not going to show you all the gory details, but this is a main finding. So these are graphs. The three graphs are the same format. On the x-axis, we have the mouse hearing range, so they can hear ultrasonic. So a human would hear up to 20K when they're born, and then as you age, your sensitivity to the high frequencies go down. Mice can hear above 50 kilohertz. And then we did a wideband noise stimulus. This is your ABR threshold. So down is good, and it means uh, for the baseline recordings, these mice are old to start with, so they're above 20 months old. So their hearing is not very good. But these would be the thresholds at the baseline, so the beginning of the study. And they're the lowest because that's um, the point at which they have the best hearing in this study. And then this first graph is the control group. And there were significant elevations in the thresholds over the six months period for the control group. So that's age-related hearing loss. The thresholds are going up. This is why your grandparents and parents can't hear you and they tell you to speak louder and slow down. Okay, this is the mouse version. Then we gave two doses of the ergothionine. The low dose is in this graph, and the high dose is in this graph. And you can see that there was not as much elevation in the thresholds in the group that got this amino acid therapy. And it turned out, for whatever reason we don't understand yet, the low dose was better than the high dose but the high dose was still better than the baseline. Okay, so less threshold changes. Now the shocker here, which is why we ended up getting two grants from this after we generate these data, it only worked for the males. <laughs> so sex differences are big at NIH, which helped us. So if you looked at the females, their low dose and high dose look just like this, no, no benefit. So that's male. And then this is another auditory measure which is popular now because it has to do with synaptopathy which is a degeneration of the synapses in the cochlea that occurs during aging. So without going into all the details. I'm going to show you, this is the males again, fourth month, sixth month. And this is an amplitude of a brain wave that corresponds to the integrity of the synapses in the cochlea between the hair cells and the auditory nerve fibers, which take the information to the brain. So on this y-axis, if the amplitude goes down, that means there's some neural, neural problem in the cochlea that's occurring, and this occurs during age-related hearing loss. So that's what this y-axis means. So down is bad here, and zero is relative to the baseline, the starting point of the study. And this is two different frequencies. 16 kilohertz, 24, and this is the wideband noise. And the take home message here is that the control mice, the ones that didn't get the therapy, their brainwave amplitude went down, meaning there's trouble in the cochlea. For the four and six months, generally, again, the low dose was more effective. This means that the amplitude didn't change over the six months. 
so the controls went down, the low dose didn't change, and in all the cases, the high dose was better than the controls. So four months, six months at this frequency. Similar trends, some of them were statistically significant. So this indicates, again, in the males, so the females, they would just show the same as the controls. So this is another indication that this amino acid is slowing down age-related hearing loss. So we also do biomarkers. So in my lab, we can measure hearing. We can do molecular and anatomical biomarkers. So this is a little bit of the data for what's going on at the molecular chemical level. So these graphs show control group, low dose, high dose, again. And this wasn't exactly the same. Sometimes the high dose was a little better in terms of the biomarkers. This is uh, PGC1-alpha. It's kind of like an antioxidant. It's something that um, benefits cells. And this is the change relative to the beginning of the study. So the beginning of the study would be zero. And um, actually 1.0 is the beginning of the study here. So the control group didn't change much in terms of the biomarker. But the treatment groups improved on this positive biomarker. Here is SAD2. That's a potent antioxidant that's actually found in the cochlea. So again, uh, 1.0 is your control, and this is the improvement relative to the control. TNF-alpha is an inflammatory biomarker, so that's bad. So the control group had this relative, and the low dose and high dose, high dose reduced this inflammatory biomarker so that it means it was blocking some of the inflammation. This is an apoptotic biomarker found in cochlea. And again, over the six month study, so these are all at the end of the six months, there was a significant decline in this apoptotic program cell death biomarker. So these are some of the biological mechanisms by which this improvement in the hearing is occurring in the cochlea. So this is a summary of some of the things I've been talking about for erdothionine. The idea is it can counteract some of the aging and processes in the cochlea, and there's oxidative stress and inflammation occurring, and the EGT we've shown can decrease some of these inflammatory and apoptotic pathway biomarkers in the cochlea. And these are upregulated. These are good things. These are antioxidants and growth factors. <coughs> so that's the end of part one, ergothionine. Any questions, comments, complaints about that? Okay. Do you have any idea why it only works in the male mice? Yes, we do. So, as is often the case, we did a lot more experiments than what I have time to show today. So there are receptors, which are ion channels for to get ergothionine into cells. They're called OTCN1. We looked at the expression of those, and it was less in the females. And then you might say, well, how come they have fewer of these channels. Then you get into the interactions between sex hormones and hearing. So these are postmenopausal females. They don't have estrogen and progesterone. And it looks like the expression may be related to those. And also, interestingly, it looks like there's some relation to between red blood cells and the ability of the ergothionine to have its action, and it 
looks like females red blood cells are not as good when they get old they don't live as long and they have different properties. So those are things we're looking at. That's what we put in our grant to look at why doesn't it work and then can we get it to work? So we're doing studies now where we're looking at premenopausal female mice, perimenopausal female mice, postmenopausal. Maybe it works earlier. Yes. Is the progression Yes, so women and female mice generally have better hearing than men. And in humans, it's because men do more horrible things to their bodies than <laughs> the average. But then when women go through menopause, they lose estrogen, which is good for cells. So then the men catch up a little, little bit. Okay. And the same thing with mice, aging, aging mammals. So generally, women have better hearing, but then when you get postmenopausal, the men catch up. Well, the women start losing it more. So you had a question. Um, I was just going to ask if it seems to be safe, would it be safe also for people with kidney failure? That, I don't know. Kidney failure is, you have to be very careful, yes, about <clears throat> taking supplements and drugs. So I don't know. All right, so we'll go to part two. All right, we have some other NIH, and we got a bunch of patents on this one. So I mentioned before that many drugs do good things, but most drugs end up never getting through four levels of FDA clinical trials because they have side effects which are bad. So if you were able to deliver drugs locally in the body, you could avoid a lot of those side effects. And people now are working on drugs, and I just mentioned one at the beginning, for children getting chemotherapy, that either protect the cochlea, protect hearing and balance, or eventually will treat it. So you're gonna get people who work on organoids, and you're gonna figure out how to regenerate hair cells and cure deafness. But, if you put in something that makes cells grow, what's the main side effect? So this will be our quiz question for today. Cancer. Cancer, right. So if you could deliver it locally, maybe you wouldn't have to worry about the cancer. You still have to turn it off at some point. But. Okay, so what we proposed and got funded to do was develop a microphone that could go in eventually into the middle ear. So you know, if you get sudden hearing loss, the treatment right now is you go to an otolaryngologist, they inject steroids right through your eardrum to try to prevent the inflammation and maybe you'll get, lots of times you get your hearing back. So anyway, you could inject things through the human eardrum and 99% of the time, it'll repair itself in a couple of weeks. So the idea here is eventually, we'd have a small micro pump that could be injected in cases where people were, say, getting chemotherapy. Then you program the pump so it goes on and injects the preventative agent like sodium thiosulfate while they're getting the chemo, preventing the hearing loss. So conceptually, what we have worked on is, it doesn't look like this. I'll show you what it really looks like in a second. But a pump where you can fill it up, it has a reservoir for the drug, it has a control unit, it has a wireless communication, power supply output that would go into the cochlea or vestibular system. And then you could get it fancy where it had a microphone, a little microphone on it. So you go to the Miami Heat game and it's 110 dB, because they're so good, and everyone's cheering, and then your micropump, microphone would sense it and deliver the preventative therapeutic agent. And we and others are working on that too. We have submitted a patent for a drug that can reduce noise in your hearing. 
And then you could have military applications, a lot of people in the military, you know, helicopters, aircraft carriers, tanks, bombs, they get noise-induced hearing loss, they get TBI, traumatic brain injury, they get PTSD, MS. So you could implant these in war fighters that are in noisy environments to deliver the therapeutic agent. Okay, so when in this field of microfluidics and microelectronics, if you're pumping at very low volumes, like nanoliters per minute, if you have any leaks, you're done. So you have to design a system with minimal connections. So in our system, we only have one connection between the reservoir and the tube that's eventually gonna go into the cochlea to deliver the therapeutic agent. So I'll show you how we did that. And you have to integrate microfluidic pumps with microelectronics. So this is more what our pump really looks like. So here's the reservoir. And in some cases, like when we initially tested it, it was too big to put in the middle ear of a mouse, which is pretty small. So we had to plant it on the back. We could refill the reservoir with a syringe needle. But one of the reasons we got a few patents on this, two main reasons, we were able to print the electronics. So this is looking at the top, this is looking at the bottom. We were able to print the electronics around the tube that it has, comes from the reservoir. So we had no connections after it left the reservoir. So all we had to do was make sure this didn't leak. And looking at the bottom, this shows you how we printed our pumping mechanism. And I'll show you some real pictures of that. But the basic idea is if you have fluid here and you have a mechanism, which I'll show you, which can expand and push the fluid that way. So you have check valves in the tube. So the, the idea is this unit comes on and pushes the fluid this way. Then this unit comes on and pushes the fluid this way. And then this unit comes on and pushes the fluid that way. So there's no connections. It's just pressure forcing the fluid into the fluid base. So this is a traditional peristaltic pump, like you might see in a clinical setting. And the idea of peristalsis is you're pumping uh, like the heart. So the heart pumps, pumps, pumps. It's not a continuous pump, fluid pump. So this is what it looks like. So this is what our peristaltic pump. So those, these are the three pads I just showed you. This is the tube. And the idea is you push that one, then you push that one, then you push that one, then you start over again. This is what it actually looks like through a microscope. So there's actually a thermistor which can make sure the temperature doesn't go crazy. And then you have a microheater. The microheater is based on a micro-resistive network. So what happens when you push when you send a current through a resistor. Heats up a little bit. So the idea is you send current to this unit first. It heats up a phase change substance, which kind of looks like wax. So this is when it's not heated, solid. This is the actual tube, picture of the actual tube. And then when you heat this microheater, this melts, and when it melts, it expands, and then it pushes the fluid forward. So that was another thing we had to patent on. So that's our version of a micro peristaltic pump. So this is actually the size of our pump at the moment. It's still way too big to go in the middle of the year, okay? 
So that's what it really looks like. This is another picture of those three pumping units. So here's the tube with no connectors. And then these are the three pumping units with the thermistor and the heater. So that one goes on, that one goes on, that one goes on. And you can, you know, see the fluid moving through the tube. The tube is maybe a hundred and few hundred microns in diameter, something like that. Okay. So when we we wanted to know, no one had ever published any thing about pumping into the mouse cochlea because the mouse cochlea is less than a microliter in volume. So it's only 600 nanoliters. So as part of this project, we published a report on how to measure whether you're actually pumping things, something into the mouse cochlea. These are pictures of the real mouse cochlea dissected. These are forceps, which would be smaller than the tweezers in your bathroom. We could make hole in the cochlea so we could glue the tube on when we wanted to pump something in. This time we put some blue dye in it. So schematically what we're doing, this is the drawing of the mouse cochlea. We would make a tiny hole. We put in a tube of 150, 200 micron diameter. And we wanted to pump things in and see whether we were actually pumping something in. So we had more fun. And initially, before we would try our experimental pump, we would use a regular lab syringe pump, 25 microliter syringe, 140 micron diameter tubing. We'd put the animal to sleep. We would do some microsurgery, glue the tube so it wasn't leaking. And then we would pump in an agent that would show up as white in a CT scan. Then we would anesthetize the animal again, put them in the CT, the mouse rodent CT scanner, and see if we're able to pump anything in and see it. So this is a summary of part of this publication, and this, uh, these are CT scans. This is the first published CT scans of pumping something into a mouse cochlea. This is actually the glue we use to glue the tube into the little hole in the mouse cochlea. It shows up white in the CT scan. Black means there's no contrast agent. It's a type of iodine. But when it's more light than the background black, we know that we're actually pumping things into the cochlea. That's the bottom of the cochlea, the middle of the cochlea, the top of the cochlea. And since we're pumping into scale of timpani in the bottom, that's going to be whiter than the other areas. But we did all kinds of analyses. We, mod we made a model of the fluid flow and the um, contrast agent flow. We made mathematical models so we could tell that the fluid was going throughout the cochlea. And then we got to the point where the pump was small enough to implant on the back subcutaneously under the skin of a mouse. And then we would do the microsurgery, the tube would come down, go into the mouse cochlea, and then the mouse would wake up. And because we put it on the back, it couldn't scratch it. That's the one place most mammals cannot scratch. And they've lived indefinitely, you know, six months. And we were able to show that if we pumped something into the mouse cochlea, we, it worked. So our initial prototypes that are still too big could actually pump things into the cochlea. And we did some hearing measurements, so we would pump, anybody know what salicylate is? Salicylate. Aspirin, aspirin. 
it knocks out your hair cells in your inner ear temporarily. So we could, we showed we could even get hearing changes in these mice with our micro pumps by pumping in salicylic acid, measuring the mouse hearing that I showed you before, and getting the change. So this is the last slide on the pumps. As I mentioned, you could use a lot more drugs if you could do local drug delivery. So you could not only use this in the inner ear, you could use it in the brain, heart, you could use it right now if you want to get your testosterone patch or estrogen patch or whatever. It's just a polymer that degrades, it's dumb. So you could use these pumps to control the flow rate, the volume, the timing, if you know they were just put on the skin, and then you could use them in internal organs as well. You could use them maybe for anti-cancer. So that's the end of part two. Any questions? Um, I have a quick like, clarification question. So when I think of the vestibular apparatus and the cochlea, I think of it as a as a as an enclosed system, like more convective flow of these fluids. Like, uh, the fluid that's there and the fluid that's there. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Anyway, so I'm he's talking about it. this part. Yeah. So, um, like, when the, the little hammers move the liquid, they vibrate, and then, so the, of the 600 nanoliters that are in the mouse cochlea, how much are you adding to that? And then these fluids are- Like, in where does it go, right? Right, that's kind of what I'm asking. Yeah, it's normally, in the short term, it's incompressible fluids. Right. But there, is, there are, in the long term, there are um, perilymph and endolymph uh, channels that the fluid can move out of. So in the long run, if you don't have uh, pressure abnormality. So that wouldn't cause any damage to the cochlea. So if you pump slow enough, so we were pumping it in some of our experiments, 50 nanoliters per minute. So there's 600 total. And that seemed to be enough not to damage the hearing. So probably under 50 per minute or lower. But you're right, you can't just pump in and have a single pour well. Right, and also like wouldn't that cause some sort of auditory stimuli to whoever is receiving it? Probably. <laughs> Yeah, probably. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the top temperature one thing and the molten state and solid state. Yeah. Um, I was wondering of the temperature of it. And it doesn't take much. So we chose, obviously, we chose a phase change material that would be feasible. Yeah, it has to be operated by the temperature, yes. So you mentioned uh, using it on military personnel with like tracking for like sound trauma, yeah. that's a full yeah. yeah. How feasible would it be to use it on, um, I do boxing, and I have yeah. trauma to my left ear, like two weeks ago getting punched, yeah. and getting a concussion. Uh, how feasible would it be using a device like this on boxers to help with the information? That I don't have? know, it might get knocked around. You have to fix it somehow in the middle of the year. I don't know, it might get knocked around too much. Yeah. Um, what is the the volume of the micro pump? Like how many milliliters mm, for your micro? I think micro the reservoir is six or seven hundred nanoliters. Like that. Yeah. Uh, is it rechargeable? Well, that's a big problem in engineering in general. Power supply people, really bad. We don't have enough batteries for solar. We don't have anything that's anywhere near small enough to, and there's a whole nother story we could talk about another time, where biomedical engineers are working on batteries that run off the physiology of the body. So long story short, in the scale of media of the cochlea, you have a 100 millivolt positive potential, which is the highest positive potential in the body. There are actually people working on little circuits 
that could eventually run a cochlear implant or a pump like this. But ba the basic answer is the batteries are terrible. They're big. They don't have enough capacity. So we had to run ours. We would just have a wire stick it up and we'd connect it to a power supply when we wanted the pump. Mm -hmm. So that's so, a big problem in the engineering in general. So, yeah. sorry. Go you ahead. mentioned that um, you have thought of, of using it on brains, but uh, if you have to have a stick going out, it'll be prone to infections for it. You yeah, mean if you have something sticking out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so eventually you want, like hearing aids now, some of them have batteries you can put in a little holder by your bed, and you, you put the hearing aid in the holder and it will recharge them wirelessly. So obviously wireless control and power supplies is what we need. If you're gonna implant it deep in the box, yeah. All right, last segment. So in the ear, there are important proteins called connexins. And these are some pictures of connexin. They're ion channels, in this case for potassium mostly. So this is your cell membrane. This is the inside of the cell. You know, your lipid bilayer, you all learned in BME 101. That's the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. So these connexin proteins make up things called gap junctions where ions can flow from one cell to the other. These are some more pictures. There's six um, connexin proteins that make up a hemichannel and then two hemichannels inside of the cell, outside of the cell, cell membrane. And they allow in the cochlea potassium to flow from one cell to another. And what happens is when sound comes in, this membrane, basilar membrane, vibrates up and down. The organ of Corti vibrates up and down. The hair cells, which are blue, have little hairs on top, which are really potassium ion channels. But these are for hearing. They're different from the ion channels that get rid of the potassium. So you have a lot of potassium in scalar media, and when sound comes in, the channel's open, and because this is 100 millivolts, what's the inside of all those cells in your body? What's the voltage, resting voltage? 70. Minus 70, good. So this is a huge electrical gradient. So when you have plus 100 here, minus 70, and ion channels open, the potassium flows in, and that's how you hear. But if you kept doing it over and over, you'd have to get rid of the potassium, or there'd be too much potassium in the cells. So that's what the gap junctions do. They transport the potassium through these supporting cells, through these supporting cells, back over here, and then there's special ion channels which pump potassium against a concentration and voltage gradient, which is very unusual. Long story short, one in a thousand children are born deaf. That's a high birth rate problem. And there's a one nucleotide change. So you have 40,000 genes. You have one gene with a one nucleotide change in connection 26, and that causes the child to be deaf because the potassium can't circulate. There's, the gap junctions don't work. So, that's a summary of what I just said. We thought if connexin is involved in congenital deafness in children born deaf, maybe it's involved in age-related hearing loss. So the first thing we did is we did one of the biggest gene array, maybe the biggest gene array studies of age-related hearing loss. We took 40 mice of four different ages, so young adult, middle-aged, 27 month, and 30 month. So these are two old groups, and this has the worst hearing. We measured it using the ABRs and the emissions, which I probably won't go into because we're 
we're getting close to the end. So the advantage of a gene microarray is you can measure over 22,000 genes in one experiment. How many can you measure in a PCR experiment? Uno. Right. So we did the ABRs, we characterized the hearing of the mice, and we did one array for one mouse, which is a huge bioinformatics statistical power we can correlate with the hearing measurements that allowed us to do a lot of things. So these are our ABRs for the mice in this study. So I already showed you the mouse hearing range. So these are the thresholds, the young adults who have normal hearing like you, middle-aged, and the thresholds go up in the higher groups. And this is another hearing measure called autoacoustic emissions, but I don't think I'll, but it's the same idea. The older groups don't do as well. So the main finding of the gene array study, I mean, we published a bunch of articles from this on antioxidants and neurotransmitters, but as far as connection goes, we just, it's just coming out this month. This is a measure of the gene expression of connection 30. We didn't find any changes in connection 26, which is the main one for congenital, but these are also important in making up those gap junctions. And so we found that connection 30 was down-regulated with age. So this is your middle age group, old, two old groups, was it? This zero means there's no change from the young adult group. So not much change there, but big down regulation in the two older groups for connection 30 and same with connection 43. So this is evidence that these connections are involved in age related hearing loss. Then as I mentioned before, uh, we do biomarker studies so this is just more of the ABR stuff, and it's basically showing that if we apply a therapeutic agent, so we wanna know, okay, there's a down regulation of connections with age, can we do anything about it with the therapeutic agent? And this is where we got, so shockingly, we got a patent on this, which I never thought I'd get a drug patent. So we applied um, this hormone that normally goes down with age, and it turns out if you supplement it, you get improvements in hearing, which I won't go into the details, but you could get improvements in ABR thresholds with a six month or four months treatment of aldosterone. And then you could also get changes in the cells in the cochlea. And this is immunohistochemistry you know, just showing that um, you could get cell preservation by applying this um, hormone. So if you had uh, two groups of old mice, the one that had the aldosterone had more cells than the normal age and age related hearing loss groups. And then we thought, can we get any changes uh, using aldosterone in connections. So what I just showed you was aldosterone can improve the hearing, can improve cell preservation. Could you get any benefits of aldosterone for the connection proteins, which go down with age? So could you upregulate the connection? So we did an in vitro experiment with cell lines from the cochlea. One is stria vascularis, one is hair cells. We also ran a kind of a comparison group where we put on hydrogen peroxide, which is a rudimentary stressor, which could be similar in some ways to age-related hearing loss. So we, before we did animals, we wanted to see, would this have any benefits in the cells? So these are plots of the gene expression of the connections. So this row is connection 30, this row is connection 43. And the take home message here is if you put on the H2, the hydrogen peroxide, and you plot the gene expression, so down is worse, you can <coughs> decrease the gene expression of the connection proteins 
with your stressor, but if you put on aldosterone, you can get increases in the gene expression of the connexins, <coughs> more so with connexin 30. And then if you put both on together, you could get a big improvement if you add the aldosterone. So this aldosterone, one of the mechanisms by which it may improve hearing in old age is through the connexin proteins. And this is just an example of one PCR run that went into the graft. And then some people say, well, we're not interested in gene expression, we're interested in protein expression because the protein is what really does the work. And this is another in vitro experiment with aldosterone. And it basically shows that for connexin 30 and 43, you put on the H2O, the protein goes down a little with 30, not so much with 43, but a little bit. And then if you put on the aldosterone, you get an upregulation of the protein expression. So the blue is the control, and these are different concentrations of either hydrogen peroxide or aldosterone. So you can get a therapeutic effect on protein biomarkers. Okay, so after we got the positive results in vitro, in the cell lines, we did the same experiment in live mice. We did laser scanning confocal to look at protein expression. And long story short here is, particularly with connexin 30, we got a big therapeutic effect in live mice, aging mice, when we gave them aldosterone for a cer uh, certain number of months. The connexin 43 was not as significant, but the trends were there. And this just shows that the aldosterone had some beneficial effect on the number of cells, but the main effect was upregulating the connexin proteins in the cells that were there. So this is just a summary of what I have been talking about it's the last data slide. So connexin, this just says that if you look at gene expression using the microarray and PCR follow-up, connection 30 and 43 decline naturally in, in vivo in living mice in the cochlea. And then if you treat them with either the bad thing, hydrogen peroxide, or the good thing, aldosterone, the gene expression or the protein expression of both of these go down with the negative treatment, they go up. And if you combine it, the aldosterone dominates. That's the in vitro situation, cell line. And then if you do it in animals, don't worry about that, that's another part of the study, but um, there's an age-related decline in vivo, and then if you give aldosterone, you can get improvements in hearing and biomarkers, connection uh, expression. So in summary, these are some of the projects we work on at USF and Tampa, and my own opinion is there'll be more successful ways to prevent hearing loss and balance problems first, going to be a long time before you actually cure permanent hearing loss and deafness. So we're working on these things at USF, for me. Most of our funding comes from NIH grants, some NSF grants, some industry, some foundations. And these are some of the people that I work with to carry out these projects. And that is it. Very nice presentation. We start with the round of Q and A, and I have a, I have a first question for you. Uh, you mentioned there at the end the KIR the four point one. I guess this is related to the the, the, the last portion of that slide. The yes. Did you find any? abnormality there that in the past that related to it. Yeah, I think the cure goes down with age as well. 
So we were starting looking at that. Still looking at that. Okay. Uh, you briefly mentioned um, using your large transfer public data set to forward data to the hearing model. Did you see any interesting patterns there? We published about 10 articles on different neurotransmitters, antioxidants, apoptotic pathways. We would often do regression correlation analyses with the hearing and the gene expression changes, and we, we did see a lot of those. Yeah. Anything pop up? Well, anything weird? Yeah, like something you did not expect at all. I would say the main weird, we saw, you know, a lot of upregulation of apoptotic genes, which is cell death. But what was weird is sometimes you would see a change using the microarray, which has a lot of data and variability, you would see like it would go up in the middle age and then go down in the old age. It wasn't always like always going down or always going up. Quick question. On the microarray experiments, were they only male mice as well? No, so we made sure we did males and females. So they were roughly equal males and females, but we haven't seen a lot of interesting sex differences in, and also in some of the groups, like the older groups, we didn't have, like we had three females and three males. Yeah. So. But for the children who were born together, The general answer is theoretically, yes. But it's like CRISPR, you know. If you've heard of CRISPR, this is the new hot gene editing that you could cure any congenital problem by, you know, taking the bad gene out of the fetus and putting in a good gene. But in the initial experiments, like in China, <clears throat> most of the babies die, human babies. Because it turns out there's a lot more going on than just inserting one gene and it affects a lot of other genes. So the answer to your question is, yeah, in the future, in your generation, you could have a deaf child, you could put in the pumps, you could have the magic curative solution that's gonna grow all the hair cells and the organ of cordy back, and then you would cure the deafness. Any other questions? Yeah, um, so aldosterone, um, isn't that also part of like the blood pressure regulation system, right, and in this an aldosterone pathway. Do you see any Very side effects of that in that, during the cardiovascular? Yeah, system? so we have a patent on this, but no one's licensing it. Because aldosterone is really tricky. It's like lithium. You would, if you give it to somebody, you have to, regu you have to monitor that like every month. You gotta get a blood test. Because if you get too much, you'll mess up your kidneys, you'll mess up your blood pressure. So it's probably not going to be used um, therapeutically unless it was an extreme case and some doctor just did it like as a clinical case. I mean, I've heard of that. I've heard of some people that have really low aldosterone and they do it, but they have to get monthly blood tests. What if it was administered on That's the way to do it. So if you could just administer it to the ear, you wouldn't have to worry about all the side effects. Yes, exactly. That's one reason we did the pumps. Also, the aldosterone in the in vivo mice was through the pumps. No. So the, none of the therapeutic effects we administered. We didn't administer any with the pumps. Right. These were these were either oral corvage, so they, they either drank it or they got injected. So they're all systemic. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so let's thanks again.